one, one, two. Am I on? Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, thank you very much for coming this evening. Um, it was rather late in the day, but I contacted a friend and colleague of mine who I'm working with on a current project called Dominic Williams, an architect, and I've invited him to accompany me on my talk this evening. He'll be joining me later on on the most recent project that um, I will describe to you. What I plan to do this evening is gallop, gallop a bit because uh, I don't normally do these things, but I've kind of put together a selection of slides which I thought might be relevant to you as an audience this evening. Um, there's about 15 works. Some have been realised, some haven't. Some are in the drawing stage for the future. Um, let's get on with the first slide. And I'll tell you what, I do need my bag, however. Cause I've got no oh, yeah, sorry. There's one or two notes that I feel I need to sort of um, resort to. Uh, obviously, you all know the party piece. This is uh, 2050. First made in 1986, opened up at Matt's Gallery in 1987. Um, most people think it was created in 1991. What's interesting about a piece of work like this for this evening's lecture is that it is an installation, it's also a sculpture. I suppose by that it's an object. It's not actually fastened to the building. It's freestanding, but it sits snugly in the space. Uh, it's a tank of used waste oil, and what it does is it shows you the building. It's site-specific, but it's not site-dependable. It can go anywhere, given my agreement. Um, for those who haven't seen it currently on exhibition at the Saatchi Gallery, its dimensions and specification are open. By that, uh, obviously, it fits any interior space, it is a tank filled with X amount of waste oil, but what that waste oil does is something quite extraordinary. First of all, it's a piece of work made out of a hazardous waste. It's not a piece of work that's made out of something that we can easily um, mentally consume. It's something that is, if spilt on clothing or poured down a drain, you're li you know, especially poured down a drain, you're liable to a fine. But here we have it in terms, in terms of notions of um, beauty, what one is actually doing in this situation is studying the room, but you're seeing it inverted. The room is actually filled up, but, it, but at the same time um, expanded upon through the illusion. Sorry, what I didn't get hold of is how do I keep going through the slides? Oh, forward, sorry. Yeah. So here you see the situation as first realised in, in late 86, opened the first couple of days of 87, on the first floor of a space where you get the doubling of the window, that lovely fortunate situation of birds flying upside down, snow coming down to meet itself. Um, what was quite extraordinary and unexpected about a piece of work like this is that psychologically you realise how, um, how there are certain inaccuracies within the human body given that we take on architecture. A simple example of that would be if you're going up the stairs in the dark, when you hit the top step, you tend to do that. You look for it. And then your brain connects and tells you you're at the top of the stairs. I've always paralleled this situation to when you're sitting in a station and the train next to you pulls out. And there's a certain moment when you realise the platform's not actually moving, so you're stationary. Um, that little hiccup that the body goes through was what was quite exciting about a piece of work like this. This is um, now in the basement of the Royal Scottish Academy. It was called the Black and White Room, quite fortunately, Black and White Room, because it was everything in um, Edinburgh at the Royal Scottish Academy that wasn't a painting or sculpture. So it would be a pen and ink drawing, it would be um, you know, a lino cut, uh, an etching. It was a hessian-clad interior that was stripped out by myself and I had some builders paint it white and then the piece was re-established locking these balusters into the oil itself to an exit which you're viewing from which led to an office. So these are examples of installation work which 
is site specific, but as I say, the conundrum is it's not site dependable. Another situation here where the ingredients remain the same, but the focus is actually different once more. This is the one that most of you may have seen at the Saatchi <laughs> Gallery. This one is at the Mito Art Tower in Japan, where little details like that door there in the office or the door there in the, the store space has been opened to continue the piece and break the piece beyond the boundary of that room. And finally, at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles, where I pulled the ceiling out, the ceiling panels, and exposed the clutter and drama of the interior, <coughs> be it the services and ducting and wiring, in, in relationship to that absolutely severe and, and tranquil surface, which is impenetrable as an oil. It's a material that's quite extraordinary. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, moving on, uh, staying, however, with the Mats Gallery, what I've said is 15 pieces, but I've, I'm trying to pot some history here where I've been given some privileges, and that's probably through this particular gallery. It's very difficult um, to work in situations doing this kind of work where you can be given carte blanche. By that... I interfere and adjust architect architecture. But what I don't want to do is violate architecture. Um, but at the same time, uh, by that what I mean is when I make a piece of work, I like to adjust and move architecture around, but I will certainly try to leave it as I found it. Um, here, following on from the Matt's Gallery idea with the window, or the reflection in the window, I wanted to create a more physical situation <coughs> And um, where you had the doubling of the space through reflection in oil, and, and, and particularly the doubling of the space outside through that reflection, I decided to come back and focus more on the space of the interior. And that peculiar boundary or division that we confront by gazing out or by people looking back at us. You know, the window is quite an extraordinary <coughs> phenomena. And so here, what I chose to do was to somehow play with space as an architectural element and make an adjustment so that the space was compressed within interior and we allowed the exterior to flow in. So what, what happened was um, about 16 feet by the 7 foot high crittle clear window <laughs> was extracted very carefully. It's a bolt-together structure, so one planned the operation. And this was pulled into the space and allowed the exterior to flood in. Um, it was very difficult to know how to allow that connection from the window to work back to its exterior. So what I decided to do was think about the kind of imagery and structure that sits with windows, like curtains, uh, that puckering of material. And at the same time, to copy something of the fabric of the building. And fortunately, that was a kind of a glazing structure. I mean, I don't know if anyone can see the details <coughs> here, but basically you've got a, a grid system in steel that works top and bottom, where there is this, this sort of notion of inserting of panels, which is rather like glazing. You've got the crittle clear and you put glass in. You've got softball dropping into these panels. And at the sides, you've got a very industrial PVC, which you see on um, TIR lorries going across to Tehran. You know, th this is a, like a heavy-duty plastic that protects the back, of the, the back of the lorry. This is what I use to protect that very fragile boundary between interior and exterior. And this was not what the viewer normally saw, but this gives you some idea of that peculiar angle and perspective that played out to the outside world. I broke that sort of definition of the boundary line that operated with the brick wall and that uh, asbestos <laughs> that you probably see up there. Um, ideas like the oil and this come from all sorts of peculiar situations. They're not just fed by one instance. They come from unstated work that I always look at. And by that, I see things in the street, I see things in my studio, I see things all over the place, and I make notes, I take photographs. And they somehow well up months or years later, and they become pertinent at a particular point. And um, I 
was working in the 80s with two very close friends, Anne Bean and Paul Burwell, in a band called the Bo Gamelan Ensemble, and we were invited to a, um, a drum festival on the island of Sado, just off from Japan. Now, the Kodo drummers who were hosting us, and along with a whole load of other people, had this dormitory that we were staying in, which was the most extraordinary thing I'd ever seen. It was a contemporary building, but right in the heart of this interior was a cottage. And it was one of their founder members who had lived there and died. And in his honour, they built this whole megalithic sort of um, totemic structure around. So as you walked through the corridors, you came across this interior. And it reminded me of my residency in Berlin when I used to travel to the Pergamon Museum and see those um, lovely lapis lazuli gates, the Babylonian gates, and see bits of uh, Rome um, sort of focused within um, these rooms within a museum. There's this idea of putting rooms within rooms. And what you will discover is there is a sort of a sense of the exterior coming inside. There is a sense within the work of this notion of swapping things over. This is um, now San Paolo. This is, uh, I think, 91 or 90. Um, I've got the particular dates. This is a rather interesting story. I feed off the information given to me. I don't decide the spaces that I work with. I always work with what's given. And uh, through a series of faxes over a couple of months, I realised a quite a complicated mistake had occurred in that they were very happy that I was arriving as a sculptor and they've got this great wall for me. And I couldn't understand suddenly, at, well, at the last minute, how I could really start to use a wall. I was a sculptor. I needed to use things that were orientated with gravity and based on the floor. But then I thought, well, no, OK, I'm going to be a sculptor working with the wall. Now, this is a spin-off slightly from the... Uh, from the, she came in through the bathroom window, the window piece that you just saw, and also information supplied to me by the people running the, the San Paolo Biennale. Beyond this wall space was a service area, it was not the gallery. And I became intrigued by that, and I wanted to puncture that, that division so that we were available to a gallery space and also available to a service space, as I found out, beyond. So I took out there with me a greenhouse, uh, your typical English, you know, greenhouse. Uh, but the section that remained within the gallery that worked back to that sort of strange peeling back, that archaeological exploration of the wall, um, which kind of paralleled the sort of grid work of the, of the greenhouse architecture, um, that sat without glass. So it became just a kind of a rib framework. But beyond there was a glazed-in area at the back. Now, sitting within that structure were two insectocutors. Sorry. Um, were two insectocutors. Now, they weren't there to exterminate flies necessarily, but they were there sitting as a metaphor. Because what was intriguing to me was that when the audience were first let into the private view, they were drawn to the piece of work quite obviously because of what was presented beyond that excavation. They were also drawn there by the kind of strange light that kind of purified the space within the greenhouse. And like the fly, they were drawn inadvertently behind that wall and trapped in a space that wasn't the gallery. And so they were in amongst the kind of cleaning equipment through that door and the lift shaft, looking back to the onlooker. And again, this was a site-specific work ca that came out of taking a greenhouse to Sao Paulo that then went into a travelling show to uh, the Ukraine and to Russia. This was in Kiev, the House of Artists, and the piece was just rammed into the office so that when one approached the work, you saw the typist and the library, etc., within the wall. And then it went on to Moscow. So, again, um, you know, the focus is moved slightly, but we have a situation where... Um, the ingredients remain the same. What is rather interesting for me is this piece, and different to all the other others, it, for me it didn't work, and I think it's because as Westerners we read left to right, and as you can see here, everything rose from your left upwards, so you read the volume of the skeletal shape 
up to the beam. But on this one, it was working the other way round. This is an interesting example because it's a commercial gallery in Italy and they will not allow any tampering of the fabric. Um, and of course, as a sculptor, one is sensitive to the site and the situation. And I, that's what I love. I will work with that. So it's the second example where, I, where I've actually taken my own architecture to the venue. And although it's not very descriptive here, what it is is your English cabin, your weekend cabin. I mean, these are all where I've used my own architecture. They're all sort of senses of, inca they encapsulate a sense of a lifestyle, be it weekend or what, but they sort of have this sort of rather quirky Englishness about them. And this was a weekend cabin, which really was to present a volume that sat in a space between two rooms. By that, this impenetrable woodwork structure is actually an inverted cabin sitting on one of its gables. But part of it has actually oozed through the wall or through the doorway and into the corridor office area beyond that room. Now, there were two doorways, so one was blocked off. You couldn't use it. But to get any sense of that third space, the third area that the gallery had acquired between its two spaces, one had to keep yo-yoing backwards and forwards and use every possible um, sort of opening into that third area. So you've got the inverted window here with the window box. And looking back, you've got the compressed section of the door fitting closely the topology of that wall that sort of dissected it through. And although these following slides aren't actually what one saw, this is, in a way, trying to explain how the, the actual cabin was cut. What's interesting about this for me, I mean, this is how I... I mean, I work empirically. I don't know that much about um, architecture, but I know about structure in terms of my own body, and I kind of work... You know, I mean, I think we all know how to prop the fence up. And I, th I kind of like, I've got a more exaggerated version of that. So here, looking down, you can see that going through. What I did is I came and I measured very carefully that gallery. I took those measurements back to Great Britain or England, built the, um, built the actual linear description of that area of the gallery on my ceiling of the studio, and then dropped hundreds of bits of cotton and needles down brought in the cabin and pushed it into a position where I could plot the whole thing off. So this is a rare opportunity where I actually designed and made a piece of work based on factual information from the site, but bringing it back to the studio and then taking it back again and it fitting absolutely beautifully. But unfortunately, I wasn't um, ad you know, adept enough to sort of work that out mathematically or on a computer. It was done through split shot needles and cotton. But it still worked, you know. So these are kind of like just a few uh, bits to show you the way the thing was like put together to take the stresses on the roof and the kind of strange angles of cut that had to be taken into consideration to make this thing fit so snugly. Um, jumping up quite recently now, we're into 92-93. This was an interesting example of a sculpture where it was impossible for me to go and visit the site. I mean, the habit normally is for me to be invited. I don't sort of dream up spaces. I always base my work on an invitation. And then when that invitation arrives, I will either go and visit the site or I will work from photographs or some other form of documentation, normally a video. This was Sydney, it was the Sydney Biennale in December 92, and the director, the chief curator, Tony Bond, invited myself, Rachel White-Reed, Helen Chadwick, and uh, Melanie Council, and there was one other, gosh, she'll kill me, <laughs> uh, I've forgotten, but anyway, there were five of us, and um, anyway, so... Uh, I was, living in, I was living in Berlin at the time, and I said it was absolutely impossible with a schedule to be able to come out to Sydney. And in a, in a strange way, it doesn't always work when you go and see the site. I've been to visit interior spaces of architecture, and I've looked at them, and I've had that funny flash where I've thought, what am I doing here? It's not, you know, 
I'm pretending something. I'm not getting anything from the space, etc., etc. What I said to Tony Bond was, please send me a video of the situation. I'm sure I can work something out. And he sent me uh, a very intriguing video. Uh, it came out completely black. It was him swearing because it was the first time he'd ever picked up a camera. And what he was trying to do was convert the three-dimensional space of architecture, of interior. Um, he was trying to describe that. It was being converted through the camera to a tiny two-dimensional space. And he was then trying to inform me of what that two-dimensional black and white was. And of course it wasn't working. So it came to me, I was confused by it. I was about to write him a letter to say, um, you know, please explain further. And then I suddenly realised he'd actually done something very well. He'd given me a verbal description, rather like the flat two-dimensional print, the blueprint of architecture. You know, you can convert from the building back again as opposed to always working up to three dimensions. He kind of brought it back to a rather confusing situation where he was looking through a viewfinder at the room. So I went to Sydney, finally, with a transcription of that space. The, I mean, I, I, I must admit, I treated it rather literally because um, the whole theme of that b &R was to do with barriers, boundaries, and the breakdown. And what I did is I took the two ton of steel fire door that sat in my rather forlorn and derelict site that was outside of the big, lovely white gallery space beyond. And uh, I broke that barrier down and suspended the two doors and then had um, a sign writer come along and place his description of that room on the door. However, whilst being there, I became very frustrated that my process of removal, my thing of undoing and putting the door somewhere else, didn't really work with this immaculate white sign writer's lettering. Um, so what I proceeded then to do was to, in, to buy several engraving machines. And I spent the next seven or eight days in Sydney, goddammit, um, scratching away day and night at this two-ton of steel <laughs> fire door to put his writing in there. So it was a, it was a rather labour-intensive situation. But fortunately for me, it, it worked quite well. This was the first piece of work that you came across when you entered the, the bonded, uh, the bonded um, warehouse in Sydney. And it really acted like two pages of the, like the introduction to a book. So it's what you entered the space reading, and it's what you left the space reading. Um, and it was really, a, it was actually a description with all the confusion of that description or the confusion of reading the description of the room, labelled down onto the fire doors. Um, again, an example of a site-specific work. This is a very interesting exhibition, actually. This was a show of site-specific British sculpture that went to Oslo. It was so successful, it went to... Um, Budapest. Unfortunately, I couldn't go because mine was so site-specific. <laughs> it was made for here, whereas everyone else toured, which was a kind of anomaly of the whole situation. I felt it wasn't, it wasn't really true to what it was supposed to be doing. Site-specific has been demonstrated with the oil um, that it does, it's not necessarily site-dependable. This was site-specific, and I read the situation to be that. This was in the Museum of Contemporary Art in Oslo. It was like a lot of gallery spaces um, a space that had a history. It was a bank. It, had a, it was a bank that was about safety and security. But within that bank structure was a museum. So you've got a, like a, you know, the Russian doll affair. You've got something within something else. And I decided to pick up that reading and base a piece of work on that. What I did is on my visit, I noticed that there was a wall actually built in the space that I was being given that stopped me seeing out over Oslo. And in a way, you could say that was the piece of work, but I wasn't happy with that. I needed, but I knew that was the clue to something. So um, I went back to England, and, and my process for working is to do with taking photographs, taking them to the studio, 
picking the photograph apart, picking the drawings apart, and sort of getting rid of all the superfluous areas of idea to finally hone it down. So I had this kind of notion of it being a bank, being a gallery. Um, so what I was going to do is put a space in a space as well. So what I decided to do was copy the uh, room that I had, and this is, you can see, a, a direct copy with the wall and floor tilted an angle to you in a rather sort of aggressive manner as you enter one of the two doors. But hidden behind it is a, an exterior structure. So the interior is much bigger than the exterior. The exterior had lost its sense of interior. And here we had basically a room within a room within a room within a room. Uh, you've got, you've got um, copies working into this peculiar Scandinavian chalet. And it was a it wasn't intended as a piss take, but there's this sort of thing where we've adopted our kind of contemporaryness from the Nordic idea. You know, we've got IKEA, we've got this sort of notion of the pine wood. Well, I took this typical English Scandinavian, Scandinavian chalet and put it in the space, hacked most of its interior out and put in another interior that was greater than the exterior that had lost its interior. I don't know if one's following that conundrum. But basically, um, this is us sort of revolving around it. And it was quite cramped. I mean, one could, it was stressed to take the, the walking of people on the floor. But in fact, I would said it was best if people didn't use that floor. And in fact, they were cramped rather like the window piece. They were cramped behind that chalet, trying to observe some lost interior of this British idea of the, of the Alpine retreat these things that sort of encapsulate lifestyles. They feature right the way through, as I said. With, with something which was totally major, which was this kind of um, corner or edge where wall met floor. So the exterior was playing a kind of subservient role to, in, to interior, which architecture is a very interesting idea. I'm jumping now to something that um, never was realised. It was a... I, I brought along a bit of... Um, typing that really explains the piece of work. Um, this is the Henry Moore uh, space, the Henry Moore studio at Dean Clough. I don't know if anyone's been up there, but it's a very beautiful space. It is an old mill and obviously supported, as you can see in this photograph, by a series of columns that run down the centre. Now, I was invited by the director to come up with an idea about four years ago, and I submitted an idea which um, reads as follows. Inspired by the line of metal cast columns that run down the centre of the space at the Henry Moore Studio, Dean Clough, one, um, one has been chosen for alteration. The column's direct relationship to sculpture is recognised. Here it connects the floor plane with the ceiling plane. It is functional as a structure and as an object to walk around. It demonstrates the sculptural process of casting and is fashioned through certain aesthetic orders. The removal and replacement of the column with a bronze copy will not only challenge the order of the space and the geometry of, of repetition within the architecture, but the inversion will also create a spindle focus for the room. The column will not lose any of its structural function as it will have a steel armature to take the downward load. The simple temporary act of substituting architecture for art not only changes the order of appearance, but the fundamentals of order itself. When our perceptions are, and, uh, when our perceptions are rediscovered and our preconceptions are questioned. Now, what actually happened is it was rejected. By th what I was trying to do was actually extract one of the columns, have it taken away with that wonderful element of the pavement or the floor area and the bit down below, that clinging mass of debris that sits onto the column, would become the capital. So we're inverting the notion of architecture through you know, these drawings. Um, and as the statement said, would create a break within an order that was established through the architectural um, strain down the centre of the room. These are the kind of drawings I was doing to sort of put forward my case. And obviously, bronze, because of it being the Henry Moore studio. Um, and I felt it was the only place that a, a structure like this could exist. 
And then a final model was established to um, convince the Henry Moore directors and the structural engineers. Unfortunately, it was refused. Um, I mean, I won't read necessarily out why, but I thought what was quite interesting was, as Stuart Mills points out, the floors above the studio are occupied and there is not the remotest possibility that either the tenants or the landlords would allow such an exercise to take place. Um, they were quite horrified by something which I thought was quite an interesting idea, given the fact that if you hit it with a forklift truck, you'd have to replace it. This was uh, Matt's gallery again, last uh, year before last, um, a piece called Water Table, this is where I'm going to jump now to some process. I don't dwell on process. The material is never really um, an issue that establishes itself at the beginning of any idea. The material is a suggestion that always comes from the idea and becomes a very established and prominent aspect of the work and normally drawn from a process. But um, at the beginning of this project, there was no idea that I was going to use the certain structures that I was to use. My initial aim was to dig down into the un as yet unused second gallery of Matt, uh, second space of Matt's gallery to locate an inverted um, cricket pavilion. Uh, unfortunately, the space had, compl had structural complications. It had four uh, downloaded members, downloaded steels that were taken onto large pads that sat on very soft soil. And then you had a very shallow um, kind of foundation to the actual brickwork. So I knew I was limited in how far down I could go. So the way forward was actually to experiment, was to say, okay, let's just go down and dig. I know what I want to do, but I know that there's going to be some problems. So we put down a pilot hole, a four foot square, and we called in a company, a structural engineering company, Price and Myers, and Robert Myers very thankfully um, gave his own free time to look over the whole project, actually. And he came down one evening. This is unbelievable. He came down in his white shirt, you know, and he didn't get dirty. You know, I was standing there completely black. Um, but anyway, he came down. He kept boring for about four hours and drawing out samples, these little turds that sat right around the hole, and he was kind of like in raptures about what was down there. But in conclusion to that, and through his suggestion, it became impossible to actually go down three and a half metres because we were going to hit water. And what we were creating was a sump. Um, you know, by, as you know, you know like if you take away the pressure within the water table, it'll seep in, and you'll then have falling, rather like, when you're on the beach digging the hole and the water's coming in, the sides are always giving way. Now, unfortunately, Robin Klasnick doesn't own the building. He is responsible to landlords who, uh, sorry, to managers who are responsible to landlords. So we had to go through all sorts of contractual agreements to allow me to experiment further. But this was a wonderful opportunity because we secured that with the guys who run the space, which is actually Acme uh, Housing Association or Studio Association, and um, they were okay about it, and Robin, I know, always gives the go-ahead. So we went ahead and dug bigger, and it became evident in the next couple of weeks. It had to be tight, because I was within a certain schedule. But what became apparent was that I wanted to now work with the water. There was a table, and I had to kind of connect that table in some way. So what better than to find another table? So through a series of... Um, rejection, I actually ended up with a billiards table, which was perfect in that all my phoning around, I discovered that the billiard table I bought was made in Whitechapel and round the corner from the very space that Robin now occupies. So there was a kind of an interesting history of bringing back. Um, it was the Rolls-Royce of tables, and unfortunately I had to cut it, but um, <laughs> it, was a, it was a nice billiard table. Um, so it was decided to bring this absolute sense of order through the table. Um, if you think about the billiards table, it's, it's got these six holes in it, so a seventh pocket wouldn't affect it in any way. Um, 
it represented a certain order that was ajarring to what one saw outside of the back of the space and the kind of chaos and the natural breakdown of dereliction that was infiltrating that whole area. The reason I should say that I decided to put the table eventually below ground, or the reason I wanted to put something below ground, was that this was a space that no one had used before, and I didn't want to interrupt the actual architectural space. I wanted to put something outside the rented area, and I knew I could go outside the window in the canal, or I could go up through the ceiling, or I could go down through the floor. So I would leave the immaculate idea of the modernist white cube or the modernist white rectangle available for people to look at as an architectural idea with a sculpture sitting in it. So we had this whole series of um, <coughs> operations going on, and my true English way I delegated. And um, <laughs> um, actually, I get totally involved. I always put teams together, and I get totally involved for various reasons. One was very well explained by Gordon Matter Clark, which was to do with a kind of a work ethic. You know, there's those who delegate and there's those who actually get their feet dirt or their fingers dirty. And I'm of that type who don't believe in ordering others. I think if you're going to do something, you do it with others. And at the same time, I get fed by ideas when I'm doing something, like digging down that four-foot hole and finding water and bringing in Price and Myers and Robert saying, well, do this, do that. You know, you can't touch this, you can't touch that. Um, being there on the site rather than having a phone call from the builder was so important. And that's how the ideas come around. Anyway, what transpired is we discovered the water table. It was three metres down, so I put a four metre... Well, this is only ten foot, but we coupled up some Hepworth piping and we dropped it down into London's water table and we connected up through a series of plumb lines and... Um, uh, floating some foundations and tables or rafts of concrete, we finally connected up to, to the actual sculpture. These are the kind of like, the, just giving you an idea of the idea of going down into the ground. Sometimes an idea like this, I mean, I spoke to one or two people about it, and excuse me. <laughs> what's intriguing is when, you're getting, when you get going on an idea like this, it's somewhat um, unusual to begin with. But the more research that you take on, the more the kind of sense of archive builds. And what was lovely is I actually phoned the um, uh, British Waterways Board uh, who put me onto Thames Water Authority. And when I st started asking for computer printouts of the London water table, they said, that's very easy. We've got 300 holes in London that we have dipsticks in and we read them every two weeks, and those are monitored, and we can get an actual readout of what's going on from water coming off the South Downs and the Chilterns. And the first reading they do is always at Trafalgar Square. There's a hole there. There's a guy who goes, and he puts a rod down, and he reads it. And I thought, well, this is amazing. You know, I thought I was out to lunch, but this guy is doing this 300 holes around London. Um, so it, it kind of, it was, it was kosher. Um, the other thing was, is that he also explained to me that they are in a panic about London's water table. It is furiously rising, and the problem is that in the last century, most factories in London had their own well where they drew water to create the steam to generate their own plant. And now we're not drawing that water off. There's a lot of wells that have been covered over in the foundations of factories that um, used to, once upon a time, pull that water up. So me putting a hole back in a factory was like following something 100 years ago. Um, so it, was, it had that kind of nice knock-on effect where that research gives you um, a friend or an ally to sort of commit yourself to. This is me playing around with the table, testing it, putting the top section of pipe in, um, trying to find a placement where the pipe was actually sitting on a cushion. This was Hepworth who sponsored this pipe, if Hepworth are here. <laughs> um, but uh, what's interesting is I spent two weeks going through aesthetic decisions about sewer pipes. And they were great because they had a pipe that had a rubber cushion, a rubber gasket that received the next engagement, the male-female engagement. And I 
housed it right on the cushion. So where I cut that cushion away from that 90-year-old table, um, it, there was a sort of sense of the pipe trying to rejuvenate the cushion. Joel, can we have the... There's a, a, a just a quick minute video. You'll recognise the voice. How do I turn this off? There is a bit of a run-in on this. Um. The piece is called Water Table, by the way. There, sh there should be sound. That's it. Okay. Um, straight after that, almost directly after that, I had to go to Los Angeles and put in two works at the Museum of Contemporary Art. And you saw the first one, which was the old party piece, the 2050 oil. Um, but I had to invent a new work. So, of course, I was um, reeling from all the focusing on the water table, but at the same time open to any stimulation that was going to hit me in Los Angeles. But it actually happened on the flight in. And this is like what happens when you come into Lax over Beverly Hills, and you just look down onto these modernist 60s swimming pools. This is the chief curator, Paul Schimmel, by the way, <laughs> in his swimming pool. Everyone's got this kind of lifestyle. And this is a Catalina three which uh, is a very popular model in Beverly Hills. <laughs> and as I researched it for a couple of days whilst there, uh, decided to fix upon the idea of doing something with a swimming pool. Again, the encapsulation of a lifestyle. But I think what was f a focus for me was that I was beginning to recognise that with Los Angeles, you've got Tinseltown on the one hand. I mean, you've got this city of artifice, basically. You've got this Tinseltown with this extraordinary amount of wealth, an extraordinary sort of setup that caters for a flamboyancy. But then you've got this extraordinary squalor, parallel to the fact that you've got a, like, a lot of architect, uh, architectural damage through earthquake. You know, it lives on that fault line. And, you know, it's just this kind of strange conundrum of the two existing side by side. Wealth, poverty, you know, extreme sort of leisure pleasure, along with things that are rather run down and seedy. So I ordered my own Catalina 3. I had holes put into it like a colander to render it useless as an actual swimming pool. I had a 48-foot 
aluminium pipe, 23, dim 23 inches diameter rolled. And rather as a sister piece to the water table, I put the pool into the museum and ran the pipe up to reality through the Itazaki pyramid of the building. This is us unloading stuff. We had the road blocked off and took the front of the building out. We <laughs> someone measured wrong. <laughs> Uh, we put a, 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 um, a scaffold tower up, up to 65 feet, up to the skylight. And what we did is we created this canopy. This, by the way, I included this slide. This is a guy, I've forgotten his name now, Greg Abbott. He was the guy who made the pipe up. He started life as an architect, gave it up, and went into steel fabrication. I was talking to someone early on about this. Uh, a very interesting guy. He did everything with string. It was, he was a complete empirical thinker. I mean, he... You know, he was very much of my ilk. You know, I'm, I'm not one who's that versed to calculation and maths, but I could certainly get eight or nine people to stand on something to know what way it's going to bend. And this guy did everything with string, and he came within millimetres of locating the whole of that pipe up into that tower. Anyway, we had a, uh, a company come down from San Francisco. They... They were a, a team of riggers, four of them, out of the hills, and they just put this stuff together. It's great working with teams because they've, they've got all these skills that come together, which are very communal. You know, we're all pulling on ropes, we're all talking to each other, we're all watching what's happening. And there's a lot of information that's going through that. I mean, it's quite a sophisticated situation to be in, actually. And I was sort of like trying to think, why wasn't I recording this? Why wasn't I listening to you know, and making notes about what they were shouting to each other. Anyway, we got this pipe up, we hauled it up through the skylight, and um, Greg Abbott came back with all the poles that he'd built to copy the Itazaki architecture to strap the piece up at the top of the building. That's me at the very top, overseeing the job again, <laughs> from the outside. <laughs> um... That's Greg bolting up the arms that you can see. He's made these special clamps that go onto the actual architecture that follow the language of the architecture coming down onto the aluminium pipe. And then we wheeled this rather peculiar object in. I must admit, when the pool first arrived, I was rather taken back because of its ugliness and yet its beauty. And I realised now it was an incredible metaphor for... Los Angeles, I mean, I've explained to you, the kind of run down with the tinsel town. And you've got this exterior, which is always buried in the ground. Um, and here it was, available for viewing, along with this beautiful baby Bahamas blue pool, which gives you this sort of notion and sense of paradise. What's interesting, actually, is, I mean, it wasn't a reading off the architect, but the actual downtown museum is buried in the ground. I mean... He, Itazaki designed it so that to be earthquake proof. They dug down five floors. They built four floors of a, um, sorry, two floors of a um, car park and then put two floors in of a museum and it came up to ground level at the roof and the whole thing sits on ball bearings. So if there's any lateral shudder, the thing is just kind of wobbling like a jelly but it won't fault. Vertically it'll go but horizontally it's riding like every other building in the neighbourhood. And finally, this was the situation that one came into. Like I say, the sister piece to water table. One arrived to, from your Beverly Hills pool into the Museum of Contemporary Art and witnessed this strange situation where here the holes functioned in a specific way to allow the, viewer, the viewer's gaze to swim beyond the canopy of fiberglass out to feature certain evidence that was beyond the room. It was the, f the little fire extinguishers. It was the scuffs in the paintwork. It was the, the skylight. But there was this one hole in the piece that led you up to reality. It took you beyond the artifice of the Bahamas Blue and took you out to a reality of the, of the Los Angeles world. And it acted like an enormous ear. I mean, it was an incredible sound of traffic that came down into that rather quiet and precious space. And it brought the outside in once again, but took you as the viewer outside. 
And this is you climbing those deep end stairs to go diving up the drain to where the real world is. And that was when you looked up and saw the skylight, but you weren't quite in line with the pipe, but only with the wall. And then you looked up and this other blue, the real blue, came into the room, 48 feet up. OK, I'm going to dash a bit now. Um, getting on for an hour. That's the final shot on that one, process-wise, taking you out through the skylight. And here again, you can see those four arms that um, Greg Abbott built based on a sketch with string. Amazing. Um, I threw this piece in. This is quite recent, and this is really... This tested my versatility to um, response. Now, this um, was an exhibition in Mitzpah Ramon, which is in the heart of the Negev Desert in Israel. It's an absolutely fabulous area, but they've put this strange town full of Russian immigrants right in the middle of it. Um, and they had an art in process exhibition there. And I could only give three days, but they wanted me to go there and make something. And I knew the fatal mistake for me would be to go there and do something in sand, because that's all there was. So I went out there with one slide and a glue gun, and I made a very, very simple piece. Before going out, I took a boat trip down the River Thames from Westminster to Tower Bridge, and I taped the guy who described all the architecture, all the sites, either side of that water, that natural form that divides a city, and played that in this little bunker that I found outside on the village edge. And I went up to the local tourist point that overlooked the Negev equator. And I went up to that tourist centre and I bought two postcards, one to project into as a screen and one to cut up as a structure to support the, um, to support the other postcard. So I then put my one slide, which was of Tower Bridge, and I projected it into the postcard, the blank side of the postcard. So you, from one side, you saw Tower Bridge being shown. But from the other side, you had Tower Bridge sat on the horizon of the Negev Desert, or the Negev Equator. And you had this guy talking all about the boat trip and what you were seeing, St. Paul's, London Bridge. But when he gets to London Bridge, it's very interesting, because he dwells a lot about how we sold it to the Americans, and they've put it in a desert. And this was like a very simple way out about them think, the Americans thinking they bought Tower Bridge. And it was a kind of a three-day little hit that was very, very playful, but I enjoyed doing. So you've got the Negev Desert at the back with Tower Bridge sitting on it. And it requires, in that expanse of landscape, very, very close scrutiny. Suddenly the space has been congested down like postcards do, that we do all over the world into tiny little moments of like, wish you were here. But it had that kind of interesting history of building an artificial river through something. This I threw in as the only example where I've been allowed to make a public art work. It was a very intriguing one. It was, it was one I wasn't actually happy with to begin with. I was flown to Japan, to Tokyo, to look at a new area of their city that they've expanded on, which is uh, 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 Tachikawa Prefectory, which was an old US Air Force base which has been taken over now by the city, and they're developing that plot as, as hotel and um, banking, basically. And they've invited something like 100 artists to put work in over a two-mile, a two-square-mile area. Very, very congested. But when I got there, they showed me a hole in the ground, which was stairs down to the services to the local prefectory to supply gas, electricity, etc., to the hotels and the banks. And I decided rather than hide... They wanted me to hide that hole in some way. And I chose to announce it by casting in aluminium your typical two-up, two-down English staircase and putting it over the top. I mean, I've been to Japan five times now. And my, to my amazement, what's, what I always find is that with the congested space, they build upwards and it's great. But you can't read the language. So there's always staircases going somewhere. And you don't know whether you're going to, like, the hairdressers or a brothel or a... You know, it could be anything. You, you know, you don't want to get embarrassed by where you go. So, anyway, so I've got this kind of... Um, 
situation, but I've included it because my worry about the public art situation, for me particularly, is the sense of having to try and work with compromise. You don't... Wh when you're working in a gallery, gallery, the sense of intervention is based around a system to do with what the gallery and the artist have agreed and what is mentally known or what is shared. When you go out to the outside, I feel there's a sense of like just coexisting through the old idea of manners. You have to kind of like do what's right and, it's, and if you don't shout too loudly, we'll agree to it. It's still with democracy, really. I mean, if, because we're a dem democratic society, if we don't like something, we can always shout about it. You know, we've seen statues torn down in Russia because you've got an authoritarian situation which allows anything to go up. They allow their statues to go up, but w given that the regime will take over, those statues come down. Here, we've, we're always putting forward things, but people are so democratic, we have to kind of think about whether we're unsettling the passerby as opposed to the person who has made a specific choice to step into the gallery and become a viewer. And I think that's where my problem lies. The, the particular thing here was to do with... I don't know if you can see on those stairs, there's a, a pane of glass to prevent people walking up. And I was adamant that I didn't want that. And through a series of faxes, um, I designed an, a way out of it, which I thought was quite lateral. I increased the size of the, st of the tread. So this is one and a half scale. But they still insisted that people might attempt to climb. And I can understand it, but it, it means I'm, I'm not given a privilege or a situation to, to play fully in. It was a very functional situation. It had to have a, uh, a meter and it had to have a door in to allow you downstairs. So they called it functional art, and it was very, very functional in that respect. I'm going fast now. These are details. Yeah, I just threw this one maquette in. Uh, I was invited, along with four other artists, to Liverpool to create a, a, a piece of work. Vito Acconci, Acconci actually won the gig. Uh, I didn't submit because I was totally distracted by one bit of information. I've never propo proposed this, but I was talking to one councillor at a lunch meeting after we, all the artists had visited the site, and he told me an extraordinary fact in a very roundabout way. This is Albert Dock. This is where the Tate of the North is. And this is a model of the Tate of the North. The Tate of the North rises an inch and a half every tide because it's built in the same way as Venice is on the old pilings. And the wood expands and contracts quite rapidly. And I designed a piece of work that would throw, a, uh, I suppose, a bit like Volta de Maria's sort of unbroken kilometre. I would send down a brass or a bronze pole deep into that northwest rock so that it would be absolutely static and hooked into the northeast. And the whole of Albert Dock would rise and fall an inch and a half. And on the top floor, you'd get an inch and a half just moving every six hours on the tide. But that was nothing to do with the gig, but I was very pleased to come up with that idea. But I know, like the pillar, it won't um, be accepted. Very recent now. Gallop along. Hang on. Cutting corners. This is back where I was in Italy. This used to be an office. I was invited to go back and make a show. This is one of the series of works I made. Um, I knew it was an office. It had a very peculiar angle. Um, in the, It was three-sided square and one dissecting through. So on that far right side, it's a closed angle on 90 degrees, and this one's an open one. So I took two filing cabinets. I took a slice out of one and put it in the other to explain the angle of the room. It was a way of using an object to describe, again, the sort of architectural interior. So that's that side. You saw the other side, and that's the detail closed up. The handles are absolutely obsolete. You can't use the thing. It's not functioning. But it's gained the bit on the other side. Now, pieces feed me. I mean, I, people say, who are your favourite artists? I don't have necessarily favourite artists, but there are works that I can remember. Now, out of my whole spectrum of works, I always remember Bruce Lacey, who's not actually an artist of mine that I recognise as being a favourite. He made one piece many, many years ago, in 1991 or 92, which has kind of stuck in the background, I, and I pay homage to him with this piece of work. 
It was an exhibition called Five Rooms, and everyone had to make a room at the Serpentine Gallery in 91. And he made a living room. He put a table down, chairs, cups and saucers, and he put a cake in the middle, and he cut that cake, but he cut back right the way through the table, the chairs, the carpet, the building. And he pulled it back, and this slice of cake sat two inches back from its, its, you know, its feeder, its main cake. But the whole room had gone in the same way. It was a lovely... And I pay homage to him on this piece. This is the Towner Art Gallery. I've just opened a show there. And I think now I'd like to hand over to Dominic Williams, of Ellis Williams Partnership, who I've invited along myself this evening to talk about a project. Which it's going to be quite short, actually, but we're both engaged in a very interesting and um, complicated project. But Dominic will fill you in as the architect who won the competition to redesign the Baltic Flour Mill in the northeast. Right. Can I ask you one question? Which button do I press? Uh, to? That's forward, forward and that's forward. reverse. Okay. Um, well, I suppose the reason why I'm here, as Richard said, is to provide some uh, context um, for Richard's next piece, and, to, and specifically in the, the public art realm. Um, the, the project, I mean, the, the design project is um, in Gateshead, and uh, it's uh, a silo building on the River Tyne um, on Gateshead, which is south, just south of uh, Newcastle. Um, <coughs> and essentially the idea is to convert it into a contemporary art gallery um, and also include some uh, surrounding sites in, in terms of performance art and other installation work that could go around the site. Um, essentially it was a competition uh, we sort of won about two years ago and we had, it was quite interesting, we had some sort of temporary ideas of uh, moving a cafe structure onto the roof of the Baltic um, while they sort of raised the funds to, uh, to actually get the gallery running and other ideas where we have one floor of gallery space um, higher up and the, the void that was created by removing a lot of these sides would be a nightclub which would run and as they got more revenue we'd drop in another gallery floor and the nightclub would get smaller and smaller and the gallery finally would be complete. Um, but the Gates had kind of sort of bolted to that idea um, and essentially wanted to go for the whole scheme. Um, and that was the, the cafe. That we, so I'll quickly sort of run through the slides. What's interesting was um, as we sort of uh, developed the commentary, we were providing some sort of uh, context and also reaction to the sort of surroundings um, and particularly the sort of industrial uh, forms that sort of around Gates at Newcastle. In fact, this is Dunstan Stains, which is a, a sort of derelict um, coal uh, sort of uh, loading structure where these huge ships used to um, sort of off, offload their coal. Um, and a certain sort of uh, conflicts, uh, interesting conflicts occur actually in and around the city. We have the Tyne Bridge, which oversails um, a much older building. Um, but again, um, there is this kind of uh, feeling of, of structures, of industrial structures, um, and, the, and the way that they, they sort of jar with one another. Um, here's a shot just of catching the edge of the Baltic. Um, again, this is a view from the roof of the Baltic, which is very much, they wanted to utilize the, the view from the roof in terms of the cafe. You can see the uh, uh, sort of Newcastle from the roof, which is almost like a stage set. Um, and then on, you've got that on one side, and on the, uh, the other side you have Gateshead, which uh, is kind of was ravaged by the 60s and has a, you can just make out a structure uh, which is the Get Carter car park. You might remember the film Get Carter with Michael Caine on it. A great chase down the um, bridge. You can just see it there. And in fact, they had a nightclub on the top of that building at the time, but it never worked out. So it was redundant. But uh, it's this conflict between the two sides, which is interesting. Um, so essentially, the, the way we, we kind of reacted to that is create tone out the silos and create kind of two walls. Um, there's a view from the Baltic. You can see it's quite sort of well located within the, town, uh, the sort of surrounding town with the Tyne Bridge ahead. Um, a kind of unification of the two sides could be seen as, uh, in something like the Tall Ships Rally. <coughs> and Gateshead, on one hand, you have the civic architecture of Newcastle. Gateshead, on the other hand, um, very much see sort of contemporary art as their champion. 
and there's almost a kind of uh, showmanship that goes on uh, across the river that's quite interesting. Um, you might just see the Baltic in the background, um, which they hope to complete a kind of arts corridor along the, the River Tyne. Um, again, the idea that the Baltic would become a sort of backdrop um, to um, not only projected arts, but also things that might happen on, on, on the two walls. It might become clearer um, when I sort of get further on, the way we've actually created two art walls and dropped in floors. Um, at the ground floor is quite an interesting sort of, uh, sort of uh, silo hopper, um, which we uh, were trying to, uh, well, in fact, we're going to retain uh, some of these hoppers. We've got to remove most of the silos, which is a, sh uh, a shame, though. There are other sort of techniques we might use to uh, sort of echo those in the uh, landscape and remove whole silos, perhaps. Um, I mean, the idea is that uh, we kind of reduce the, the existing structure into two, two walls. Um, and then these, again, might be taken on by uh, artists. And indeed, Richard's uh, sort of gave, gave it, perhaps gave a clue to Richard on the south side to do, do the next piece. Um, again, we were reacting between the two walls by dropping in a cafe again and structures. Um, and essentially, we're kind of left with a uh, again, we're almost rebuilding it up <laughs> with a series of boxes where, uh, which we're just calling art spaces at the moment. Um, again, and then eventually you filter back into the, the uh, surrounding landscape. Uh, Gateshead, on the Gateshead side, there is actually some greenery, uh, which is uh, adjacent to the building. Um, the idea is you filter through this and uh, you're met with the, with the building and the two art walls. And that's it. And I, again, Richard, hopefully, will be able to show what you're going to be doing in the South Wales. Thanks, Dominic. Well, Dominic and I have been working together, and I picked up on his point about, you know, like he established two walls. And what I wanted to do was a bit like loading slides, I just wanted to drop something on the front wall. Um, when I was given the brief, it was an absolutely derelict site. Um, it had been derelict for 12 years, and I was initially going to only make a temporary work, which was to announce Dominic and his company's um, you know, design and lottery bid. So it was an interesting thing that I had to kind of create this advert, so I immediately started thinking about neon. It's interesting, because I, I mean, I used to, as a kid, make or not as a kid, but as a student, make rules about what to use and not to use. I once said I'd never make a suspended work, and I've done that. I said I'd never make a work in debt ceiling, and I've done that. And uh, the other one was never to make anything in neon, but I'm about to do that, I think. Anyway, so what I decided to do was uh, animate the surface. The piece is called The Joints Jumping. It's waking up again. It's, it's been derelict for 12 years. So I started playing around with photographs and actually looking at the geometry that Dominic was going to leave as a facade on the Newcastle side. That's the side that looks over the river. And I was going to outline it in two ways, one which actually sat with the geometry and one that was slightly off kilter. And um, I went through a series of ideas and came up with that lovely simple thing with the pencil where you go backwards and forwards. The joints jumping means that you've got one bit of neon which is on the building and one is skew width up in the air. And at night time, you don't see the building so clearly, but you'll see this thing jumping erratically, dependent on what um, sequence w that we program it to do it. I mean, it'll go probably every 10 or 20 minutes. It may only jump once in 20 minutes, or it may, it may go erratically, rather like the thing that you've seen on the Haywood Gallery, that neon, that you can't really digest the sequence of events that, that make that occur but they're all to do with sort of wind temperatures and uh, sorry wind pressures and temperatures and atmosphere atmospheric um, levels of water and stuff like that so this was a s whole series of drawings that were based simply around how to get that neon designed and then to make an identical but throw it up onto a structure that um, Dominic is taking on board with the roof and on the right flank elevation. And these are, this is, just to finish off, this is the model of the two superimposed, just showing you 
something the way it might occur at night. Thank you very much. That's it. Thank you. If they want, if it's not too late. If it's not too late, yeah. Um, I've just been prompted, if there's any questions, if it's not too late for anyone, I mean, if there's any questions, do feel free to ask Dominic or myself. But if there is, we'll have to have just a few and then continue on in the bar. As previous weeks, we've gone on a little too long in the lecture hall. But first of all, I just want to say thanks so much for really, well, I really enjoyed it. And I'm Should sure I do a bit of PR-y? Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> for anyone in, who's in London in August, there's a show opening at the Serpentine Gallery um, I think it's the 14th of August to the 15th of September. So, I mean, it's always a shame, I think, to sort of see things in documentary and never real. But there will be something in London. It's very rare for me to show in England, but there will be something in London at the Serpentine Gallery at that period. But if anyone does have any queries, both Dominic and myself, um, feel, do ask. We said it all. <laughs> the bar. <laughs>